Where are you right now? I'm great. I'm at home in Brooklyn. Oh, nice. I didn't know that was home for you. Hey, um, congratulations on Obviously. I wanted to ask you about this album title because Thank you. On a, on a listen to this album, it's pretty surprising, to be honest, you know, multi genre <laughs> thematically diverse and you worked with Mike on this who's typically you know a hip-hop producer um tell me tell me about the album title itself mostly it just came from the first word of the first song on the record from hypotheticals uh and I could give you a really long list of all the other album titles that we threw out but um it yeah it, it felt like a pretty undeniable choice once we hit on it we were just like we said it a few times we Googled it. We were like, how is there not a song or an album already called Obviously? And our our um, process for naming records in the past has been like super like drawn out. And, like we always like ha have a million ideas and then we circle back to original ideas and we're like, we're back where we started. And then, and then we settle on something. And so this one was like, we were like, obviously, obviously. We all said it like six times. And then we Googled it and then I sent it to my manager and I was like, obviously. And she was like, oh, I'll go to the label. And then, and then five minutes later, she's like, it's approved. <laughs> so it was the process was very fitting, was very fitting for it. And we were like, thank God. And we, this was in the first week of recording because we were just like, we wanted to just name the record even before it was done. Oh, interesting. Well, I wanted to ask you about your recording sort of process and even writing because you've said in the past that your band paired off to write tracks for this album. Um, was that like in a set period? Was it like a writing camp sort of set up or was it over a period of time that you did this or how did that it work? Was over, yeah, it was over a period of about a year's worth of touring. We, we discussed a lot going to sort of into a songwriting retreat mode, but we just didn't have time. We were like on tour. And then when we got off tour, we would have like a 10 day break and people have families and they were just like, we got to just do this. We got to write on the road. Um, and so it sort of started with um, all of us sharing like old ideas, old demos. Like we were all just sort of like going through our phones and our computers and being like, I have this idea, I have this idea. It was, it was very like, um, we were all very detached and not, and not precious about our ideas. And I think that that, that was a really key thing because prior to, this record, usually when someone showed a song to the band, they like had a completed demo and they would track drums on it. They would like do everything. They would put the background vocals and it was like, I think we um, sort of developed this culture of presenting like really complete demos and you don't really need to do that. We were like, this is a safe space. And, um, and that meant that like Aki would like beatbox into his phone and then like sing over it. And they'd be like, what do you think of this idea? And we'd be like, great, let's do this. In fact, actually, let's have you beatboxing on the record because that sounded great. Um, oh, see, that smooth lines it. It'd be kind of hard to say no to a song knowing how much effort someone's put into like a complete demo as well. Like I'd, I'd, I'd be like, oh, but you've just worked so hard on it, haven't you? Where it's yeah. like with that, you can kind of streamline it. Yeah, and it was great because people would just, you know, they would send a verse, a, just a verse idea or a verse and a chorus and somebody could be like, oh, actually I hear... I hear how this song could be completed. And so um, I think there were a lot of songs on the record that really wouldn't have been completed. They wouldn't have like met their potential had not someone decided that it, it didn't matter that the song wasn't good enough yet. We, someone heard it and they were like, oh, I can, I can make something happen with this. Mm, the potential. Would you repeat this process for future albums? Yes, definitely. I think. I think we would repeat it and expound upon it. We, we started co-writing during Free Yourself Up, the album that we made before. And we really sort of just barely kind of scratched the surface of it. And I think on this record, we went a lot farther with it. And so I think that this is just kind of the beginning of, of like a new process of writing. Yeah, nice. What have you learned about the way that you write comparatively to your bandmates? Um, that's a great question. Uh, well, I think that I've, I've learned that we all have, we all have sort of very obvious specific talents. So if we want to like pass the song off to somebody. Um, and I think that one of my talents is just like, is just expounding upon a, like a very set theme of lyrics. Like I, I can write a second verse. It's like, 
if I know what the song is about, I can figure out something else to say. Um, like Bridget, I think is really good at like extracting a hook in a song that doesn't yet have a hook. Um, she did that. She did that for a song that we wrote together that I started for Nobody Stopping You Now. Like I had no, the song had no hook. It had a me, it had a very like specific meaning. Um, I was like, here's what the song's about. And she was just like, oh, that's the part to repeat. That's the part to sort of like, you know, to like call out to the masses. And I was like, wow, I never would have heard that. Like I didn't even hear um, that that was like a very interesting line. So uh, she's really, really good at that. Um, McDuck and Aki are really great at writing bridges. McDuck is an incredible at writing bridges. It's like if a song you're like, needs a bridge. It's got all the things. He's like, I got your bridge right here. Um, he's very like harmonically adventurous. So, and that's a great time within a song to sort of flex your harmonic abilities. Um, yeah, so things like that. Oh, that's so good. Cause like, yeah, you're covering verses. We've got Bridget on the hook, boys on the bridges. This is like a whole form song just within the band. Exactly. It's a little song factory. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about Mike El Elizondo. Um, so he's worked with, you know, Dre in the past, um, Eminem and the likes. He's also produced one of your favorite records by Fiona Apple. Um, but I'm curious, was it a straightforward process in the room with him? Because I'm conscious that you guys have self-produced in the past. It was, it was straightforward. It was definitely a ride. Like there were definitely points where we would be working on a track and be like, hmm, I'm not sure where this is going. Or uh, he would have an idea that took a, a little bit of time to execute. And we would sort of be sitting like hoping that this was going to pan out, you know, somebody doing like 25 takes of, of a thing. And he was like, oh, not quite right. And we're like, oh, that sounded good. And he'd be like, oh, that's not quite right. And then getting to the end product and being like, damn, that's really good. Um, but the, the things that were like super, just like we always immediately came together on were drum sounds. And that's why we wanted to make this record with him because um, I think that anybody who produces in the hip hop world is like excelling at drum sounds and like he really excels at that. So we feel like the heart of a track is like the kit basically. So it's like, once you get the, once you dial in the drum sounds for a specific song, then you've like laid the groundwork and you, and you sort of know what to do with it from there. Um, and so it was always such a beautiful process because we'd be like, let's just get the drums. And they would spend like, you know, an hour, two hours on a song, just like getting the like sound dialed in. And then we'd hear it and we'd be like, yep, now ready to go play the song. Oh, interesting. Okay, so he's got that backbone beat going along for you guys. I like this. Yeah. It's really a full machine. Everyone's got their own little clog in it. Yeah. Yeah. He also like would whip up a beat really fast, like for us to play to as like inspiration. He would be like, get on his drum machine and like very quickly create something that was like super cool and groovy. And then he would be like, go play to this. That's important. It's so important in a band setting to be able to do things quickly, I think. In Australia over the past week in particular, we've had some... Um, marches, March for Justice to champion women's rights. And you've got two tracks that thematically speak to that, being a woman and the one you mentioned earlier, Nobody's Stopping You Now. I'm curious if those were born out of specific events or whether that was just like a blanket feeling that you just felt like you need to vocalize. Mm -hmm. Being a woman, Bridget has said that it wasn't really inspired from a specific end of event. Um, really just you know feeling the need to express these injustices that are very apparent and I think she really wanted to sort of she wanted to present a new emotion maybe that you don't hear a lot in songs which is which is sort of the emotion of exhaustion just like being very tired <laughs> um, and I thought that that was like such a beautiful emotion and feeling to extract from the experience of being a woman, which sort of statistically is like you do a lot more unpaid labor if you're a woman in the world. Um, women don't get paid as much, you know, therefore we might have to work harder because we're not making as much money. Um, and to just sort of present this very, uh, you know, simple 
feeling of exhaustion. I'm tired. I'm, I'm super tired. Like, how can you, how can you argue with me about this? Uh, and nobody's stopping you now. I, I felt, I, I just have been like contemplating a lot about that change in, um, sort of like a preteen's life between like 12, 13 and 14. And like how it's a time when a lot of like um, a person's weirdness can get sort of squashed and people can be like, there isn't enough, like you should tone it down. Like, I feel like I was a really weird child at 11 and 12 and 13. And then it was around that age that I was like, oh, maybe I should just like alter myself to, yeah, you know, to fit in a little bit more. Mm. Yeah. And furthermore, I think because gender roles are constricting on both sides, it makes, it makes the, the space for any weirdness like even smaller. You know what I mean? It's like we're already having to conform to some sort of like new adult world that um, we're just sort of becoming aware of. But because we're like, and there's also you have a certain gender and we'd like your gender to sort of adhere to this, like, you know, these sorts of things it's going to be even harder for you. And yeah, so the song kind of came from, you know, wanting to express to myself when I was younger and to younger people that you don't have to adhere to those things. You don't have to like squash your weirdness. What parts of your younger self do you think you squashed? What were those weird traits? Uh, I was, I was for lack of a better term, like I was, I was, I was fearless, basically. I love to like, like run around the neighborhood and like get like play in the dirt. And I love to like, like wipe out on my bicycle. I loved skinning my knees. Um, yeah, I like to like go really fast on my bike, like down like a super steep hill. And I really like, I don't know, I became like a very like scared person. Like I don't do those things. That, uh, you ask anybody, they're like, oh no, Rachel would never go fast on a bike. But I was like, I remember that I was that person. And I, I wondered if like something was different about that time in my life, if I would have like stayed sort of fearless. Yeah, I totally get that. Even just like, you know, I can remember doing tricks on monkey bars as a kid. And I'm like, oh my God, I could break my arm now. Like I would never, you know? Yeah, yeah it's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. I totally relate to that. Have you played any of these songs live yet? Have you had the chance to play to live audiences? No. We haven't. Um, we made some some videos that for some TV outlets here in the states, and that's that was the first time that we'd all played together in a room in a year, basically since we finished making the record. So yeah, we haven't been in front of an audience for well over a year. Oh my goodness. Okay, what song do you think is going to be an unexpected? banger at a live show what do you think like because you know there's always one we like oh wow that actually went down really well yeah yeah there's well the song that I'm thinking of is is a song called know that I know and it's like mm -hmm. a very classic silly Lake Street dive song we always like have something that's like cute and silly on our records um and yeah I just I have a feeling that there'll be a way for us to sort of stretch out the live arrangement there's a modulation in it so I'm hoping when we do it live, people are going to be stoked about that song. Well, I think that's the beauty of your background is that you guys all come from quite a classically, like, you know, jazz trained background. You have the flexibility to really stretch out your songs and make them so grandiose in a live setting. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can't wait to see them live. Rachel, can't wait to see you live in the flesh one day. Thank you so much for your time and congrats on Obviously. Yeah. It's a great album. Yeah. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Tate. Thank you. Likewise.